And then the age of 10, I'd always been mad about football. And then from the age of 10, I started playing for Stockport Boys. And at Stockport Boys, I was obviously one of the best best players there. And uh, there was a scout there called Barry Bunnell. And my life changed from that moment, really. Because he says your abuse started from 11 years old. Yeah, that's right. Um, and <clears throat> obviously, since I know everything about his previous, you know, as we call it, MO, you know, his operations, the way that he did things, and he he picked me out and was building a team and went to my parents and said that could have come down training at Man City at Platte Lane. And I started training there. Um, and within very short period of time and this is what his you know method was that he'd pick out the more vulnerable of players and he picked me and he said to my parents straight away within weeks really you know can he come and stay at my house it will encourage his career he's, he's a good player etc and my mum and dad you know asked me and you know with a 10 year old you you're gonna go wow if he's gonna make me a footballer then yeah i'll go and stay there so that's where the abuse started. How much does that play in your mum and dad's mind, being overprotective and then yes. something as extreme as that happening? Because I had a woman, amazing woman on Sarah Sands. Mm -hmm. Old man, 77, sitting outside the shop. Yeah. I used to talk to everybody. She's fucking amazing man. Mm -hmm. She gave up. He wanted to give her son a job, paper job, who could boost his confidence and work in the back room. Fucking old bastard abused her son. Yeah. She killed him. She yep. killed him. Back in, you know, there's many that potentially you know that that would go to those lengths to do that because in terms of that from a from a very young age it it's a life sentence uh you know I've, we'll go into it later but i've i've spoke to thousands of, and i mean thousands of people that in the last six and a half years that have all had a denominating de thing that they've said is that this is a life sentence it's how you cope and deal with that because the actual trauma never goes away. And that defined moment from a sexual touch to any kind of abuse like that from a young age defines your life. And it's how you deal with that from that age. So that defining moment, that the moment that he touched me at the age of just under 11, is a defining moment that maps out your life. And it's, it's a life sentence. And that's the point where, as soon as he touched me, I look back on it now from all the experience and the therapy and everything else. That moment decided my life path. So see, when he does that then, when you stay with him, like, because you're so young, probably don't even know about sex education and that thing. Yep. And oblivious to everything, so you become numb to it. Like, I've spoken to enough people now to understand like, how they then become groomed and think, some people actually think it's okay. Some girls have had on women, amazing women, yeah. abused at seven, raped at seven. But then they ended up, like, I wouldn't say it's like a, a relationship, but they feel bonded to that person. And in their mind, it's just mass manipulation, it's mass grooming, where they do anything for their abuser. And that's the sad thing. Like, see, after the first time, you, the first day, night you get abused, like, what were you like the next day? Did you understand what was happening? Or were you kind of numb to it? Um... It's, it's at that age, um, and I don't think it's, um, as a child, it, it is different because you, you don't understand, like say back then there was none of sex education and nothing like that. And it's, it's a case of when I think back to how I felt, I froze. And that freezing moment of that perpetrator as a child, whether you're a boy or a girl, that's the empowerment that they have and that power that they've got over you then that you've frozen and you implicit to it is that's the starting block for them and when you've frozen you then you go within yourself and it's that's the point where this fear kicks in and that's the fear start and that fear of that empowerment and the power they have over you on a sexual level is the impact it has on you and you then just switch off. How does it then change everything in your life from young kid, footballer, just loving it, doing everything to be a footballer, to then how does that then 
mentally scarring you playing football? Did your career die? Did your everything die? But were you just trying to block everything? Out? Yeah, what, what, I mean, what what happens with that? And many players have already said that with that impact of that, as a young child, you you, it's like anything, whether it's football or any sport or you know the church or that empower that power they have over you. You want to do the right and in the church, in sport, in sport especially, is that your passion is to play football or whatever sport that is. And because they've got that power over you, you, you abide to what their rules and you just continue because that in one part of your brain, it's that you want to succeed in what you've always wanted to do through your life, even as a child. But the other side, that dark and horrible events that go on and the trauma from that, you kind of try and put that out because the desire is so much to do that the amazing thing that that is in football. Did your mum and dad notice any changes in you? When they've talked back, the, the only thing that they could say to me was that I became more withdrawn and more quiet at home. Um, did they question me? He was that engulfed within my mum and dad, paying visits. He'd turn up every now and again and just say how well I was doing. Um, and in the film it shows, you know, he'd, he'd sit down and just say how amazing a player I was and how good I was. And so really he'd, he'd, in, he'd, he'd intertwined with my mum and dad as kind of a, not a family member, but a good friend as well. So they didn't, it was only obviously, you know, I spoke to him since and they said that obviously the guilt, but they, they couldn't see it back then because he'd, he'd groom them, mm -hmm. but they couldn't accept that until I broke the story until 2016. So this went on for four or five years? Yeah. Yeah. And still in the same team, still staying over and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I practically lived at his house. I was, I, I had time off school. You know, my education suffered and he used to ring up my mum and dad and say, oh, we've got this tournament or we've got this going on and we've got that going on. Is it all right if he stays? And my mum used to get on the phone, are you okay? Inside me, but his power that he was stood over me, staring at me and that overrides, overrid, overrid that, that what he was doing to me, that I'd always do the right thing because I was always a yes boy anyway.